Hello and welcome to Mental Health Matters, Spotlight on the Expert Edition. My guest today is Rabbi Dr. Yehuda Krohn, a licensed clinical psychologist who provides individual, family, and couples therapy in his Chicago area private practice. He also provides therapy to an inpatient psychiatric population. Rabbi Dr. Krohn writes and presents on Torah, psychology, and the intersection of the two. He's a board member of Nefesh International, the international network of Orthodox mental health professionals. Welcome, Dr. Krohn, and thank you for joining me today. Thank you, David. Our topic today is parenting, uh, parenting adult children who are no longer observant. And it's interesting because um, I know this is something that uh, you have a, a particular uh, expertise in and knowledge and background in. Um, it, it happens also to relate to something that's uh, some, certainly an interest of mine and going back as far as my uh, doctoral dissertation research, um, certainly, well, not exactly uh, the topic that we're talking about today, but um, uh, understanding some of the factors of why individuals choose different religious paths than their, uh, than their parents or the, their, the, the community in which they were raised. Um, but, but importantly, this has been a hotly discussed topic in the Orthodox community for some years now. And surely there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of uh, relationship dynamics um, that are, are involved in, in those parent-child relationships that we'll talk about. So I'm really excited to uh, get into this discussion today. Uh, but first I thought I'd start by asking you what brought you to the field of uh, psychotherapy? So I've got an interesting answer to that question, perhaps a little bit more self-disclosing than others. Both of my parents passed away at relatively early ages, and that made a few things, or it set a few things in motion. Number one, it introduced me to the world of therapy. Number two, it made me ask, led me to ask questions that most kids my age would not have asked. Um, third of all, it thrust me at times into the role of someone who was himself counseling others, uh, other family members, let's say. And I learned what it was like to um, hope to change someone and what could reasonably be accomplished mm -hmm. in figuring out who people were, what they were about, how to best help them. Uh, over the course of time, I was told by people who, who met me in different walks of life, you know, you ought to go into the field. And when it was time for me to leave the particular place that I was, which is called Kolel, which is a, a, a basically a think tank, a study center for Jewish men studying the Talmud, I knew that I wanted to go to psychology school. And so what was it, or at what point in your uh, in your education, in your you know uh, graduate education, did you uh, take interest in that intersection, that Torah psychology intersection, that sort of defines the discussion that we'll be having today? Well, the intersection of religion and psychology is something that hit me the very first moment that I walked into graduate school. Mentioned earlier, I was coming from Kolal, which is a really homogenous group of Torah students, Talmud students, who are, they're all men, they're all working together, studying very specific texts. They all have very similar values, very, very similar values. I walked from that into an incredibly diverse place. Not everyone was male, most of them in the program were, were women, and not everyone was Jewish, and um, not everyone was white. And it was really an eye-opener for me. Not everyone was straight. Not everyone was any of the boxes that I had constructed for myself until then. And it really gave me an opportunity to question, what are the values of my world? What are the values of the world that I've just entered? What are the... Um, what are the common areas and what are the areas of conflict? That's uh, quite a fascinating journey, I'm sure, it was, that it was for you. Um, it's fascinating for me to hear that, but uh, just to ha having 
um, for you to have gone through some, you know, that kind of um, transformation and eye-opening experience, even if it wasn't one that, um, that uh, say, impacted the, your, your, observant, you know, your uh, observant practice, um, but it sounds like it did have a profound impact on, your, on the way of thinking and, and, and your way of maybe more so viewing um, some of the aspects of the greater world that you weren't uh, exposed to in that kind of way. Yes, and nowadays we, we, we use the term code switch when we talk about someone who can think a certain way, talk a certain way, one environment, and then go into a different environment and think a different way and talk a different way, whether it's the more insular environment of the Kolel that I had started out in. It's a place that I'm still very much a part of. It's very much a part of my life, not something that I would ever wish to let go of. But then there's also the, the larger the, or the broader community that I entered. And there is that notion of how do, how do people think in each setting and how do people speak and talk to each other in each setting. Mm -hmm. So before we jump into um, in more depth into the, the topic that we're going to talk about today, I'm curious about if you can tell me a little bit about your psychotherapy practice um, and the, the nature of the clientele that you serve and sort of what, uh, what are some of the, uh, let's say, common th themes that you see with, uh, with those clients? There, there are two parts to my practice. Uh, part, the first part of my practice is the private practice that I do in working mostly within my community, but not exclusively in my community. Mm -hmm. I work with um, people who are way beyond the Jewish community in, in, in all sorts of ways. But at least in the private practice, I'm working with people whose life problems are not paralyzing. They are able to function on the outside world. Some of them can function quite well on the outside world, but they have issues. They have transitions in life, painful matters through which they're going things that puzzle them about how they act and they want to figure out a better way to do things. And that's one part of my practice. The second part of my practice is when I go into psychiatric nursing homes and I work with what many people would call textbook cases mm -hmm. of schizophrenia and um, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar with, with psychosis and get to see people who are struggling mightily and who can't live on the outside. And in an interesting way, the two practices, the two parts or the two facets of the practice complement each other. And what I mean is that if I can, if, if I'm immersed for a good part of my day with a population that really struggles to grasp or to hold on to reality, reality as we see it. Mm -hmm. And if I'm sitting with a client in my private practice who starts to veer off from something, I'll smell it or sniff it faster than most people will. And I'll know, oh, I, okay, we're, we're headed in an interesting direction here. I wonder what's going on. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the work in my private practice where people are often similar to me has made it easier for me to identify with my clients, with my patients. And so I've tried to take that into the work I do in the psychiatric nursing homes. Every client with whom I meet has to be someone, at least from my standpoint, that I try to find some common ground, with whom I try to find some, find some common ground. We're all people, we all have hopes, longings, wishes. We all have a need to have dignity, um, to have community, and hopefully we can find compassion for self and other. That's something that I bring from my private practice into the psychiatric nursing homes. And I'd like to think that those clients find such a perspective refreshing. I would certainly think so. Uh, my, I guess my, my observation is, is just that um, uh, having worked in similar environment, environments, not uh, particularly in a psychiatric nursing home, um, there's a tendency for people who do that all day, every day to, I, and I assume, it's, I I'd imagine it's a human tendency to become somewhat jaded and just kind of, um, you know, for that to be 
normal, so to speak, and 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 um, and to not be able to see beyond, um, you know, some of let's say the certain arbitrarily set upper limits of the capabilities of those patients, and so for you to be able to, you know, bring a a a, a mindset from another perspective to those patients, that makes a lot of sense to me as to how that would be beneficial to their treatment. Yeah. It's about our shared humanity. Yeah. So um, to segue a little bit, um, maybe somewhat roughly, into the, <laughs> into the topic that, that we've um, discussed uh, talking or d decided to, to talk about today, um, I, I thought I'd set it out this way. Many parents within our Orthodox community um, and in other religious circles as well, um, I don't think this is exclusive in any way um, to the Orthodox Jewish community, um, will often find themselves having to deal with children who have chosen another life path than the one that they had set out for them. Um, most often, maybe, this expresses itself in um, different choices in terms of observance of religion, but there may well be other ways that that's expressed as well. And as someone uh, who works in large part, at least on your private practice side, with members of that community, uh, what are some of the challenges that you see these parents having with raising the, their children, with parenting their children, both as say, you know, children and adolescents, and then into adulthood? There are a few challenges. I'm gonna see if I can keep them all in my head as, as, uh, as we move forward. So um, I think one of the most important challenges relates to what I would call a mythology. And the mythology is that if I am a good Orthodox Jewish parent, and you could fill into that blank, uh, if I'm any good, good observant parent of any religion, then I can control the outcome of how my children turn out. Mm -hmm. There are enough sources and enough anecdotes for people to find where they're really convinced that if I do the right things, my kids will turn out okay, irrespective of the genetics that my children inherit, irrespective of the school experiences, which are beyond my control, irrespective of just their, their development on what I would call this the standard trajectory of adolescence, which is where a child healthily differentiates and separates and identifies separately from a parent. So, so going back, I think one of the first challenges that parents have is that they believe that they really do control the outcome. And, and if they do control the outcome, the, 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 what follows from that is the belief that I must make my child be observant, or from, as we say. Uh -huh. I must, and if they're not, it's my fault. And I've done something wrong. Might even be shameful. So where might that myth uh, come from? Um, and maybe if I, to elaborate on that question a little bit, um, I mean, is this a matter of parents not having a, a, a thorough understanding of what quote unquote normal development of an adolescent is like? Um, is, is it because um, they maybe view themselves as not having deviated from, <clears throat> from how they were raised? What are some of those kind of sources that you have maybe uh, identified or seen in some of the people that you've worked with that explain why they have, why they accept this myth? Great question. Um, interestingly enough, some of the children who I'm meeting with are not the children of parents who followed all the rules. And here's what I mean. Some of those parents are what we call Ba'alei Teshuvah. They are themselves returnees to Judaism. So they, their parents might have been not Orthodox, and they somehow found, found their way to Orthodoxy. They might have 
had a college experience that led them, let's say, to study in Israel and then to intensify their study, or some other experience that brought them closer. And um, th this does a couple of things. Number one, it, uh, they're often connected with families that are perfect, or that look perfect at least, and the children seem all happy and they all seem to be on the path of their parents. And so the, the, Im the implicit message when you're hosted as someone, as you're, you're now a parent, but back in the day when you were hosted by that family is, if I just run my family like family X, then I can produce kids just like family X. And um, what's, what's interesting is some of the children will look back to their parents. Some of those children who are now veering away from observance will look to their parents and they'll say either, I'm following in your path mm -hmm. because you were not like your parents and I'm not like my parents either. I'm blazing a trail just like you did. And sometimes they'll say, if anything, I'm upholding the tradition of grandma and grandpa mm. because they were, they were people who did not let orthodoxy get in the way of relationships. And I'm, my orthodoxy is more flexible than yours. And I value relationships over, over ritual observance, let's say. And so there can be all sorts of pathways into a parent thinking that they, that they have that they have control over their children. It doesn't mean doesn't mean that it's only the parents of Bali Teshuva. It could also uh, the, the children of Bali Teshuva. It's parents. It could be parents who are who are observant and from families that have many generations of being observant. But all the same, they grew up in one generation, and their children are growing up in a different generation. And uh, if there's ever a time where we can say that our children are growing up in a different world than we are, it would be this one. Uh -huh. and that's and I was going to ask you um, ab about you know maybe some of the, the distinction as to how the those differences between child and parent manifest when the parent is from uh, let's say an originally an Orthodox background when they were raised that way compared to um, those that weren't. Um, I want to jump back for a second to something sure. that you had said about the children of, of, let's say, first-generation observant uh, parents. And, and that is, you know, you sort of pose the, the, the type of counter-argument that a child might make, which is essentially, you are a rebel, and so am I. How well is that, uh, is that accepted? And, and what does it take for a parent to sort of change their, uh, their, their viewpoint? Is that something that, once it's presented that way, they can say, huh, maybe that does make sense or or does that remain a difficult uh you know uh let's say heap to overcome obstacle can any parent most any parent who has stayed observant over the course of their life as a parent and certainly someone who turned his or her life upside down in order to become observant has made an incredible investment in being observant sure. so um they might they might intellectually grasp what their child is saying, but it's a really hard sell. Uh -huh. It's difficult for them to take it in. And, and um, can we even shift backwards a little bit? Because I had, you know, you would ask what are the factors that make it difficult for parents? And this, in a certain sense, plays into one of those factors, which is a lot of the schools that kids are, I didn't, I didn't even wait for you to say it's okay for me to shift back, but. Um, it's okay, go right ahead. <laughs> no, um, the, 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 um, the, schools, the schools that a lot of parents send their children to, certainly the strictly orthodox schools, um, if you were to use the word ex experimentation and identity formation with those schools, that are strictly orthodox, especially in the, at the high school age, which is when, as psychologists, mental health professionals, we say that's when experimentation and identity formation are happening. They would just like look at you like you're from outer space. What are you talking about? This is particularly the, the time that we need to double down on the control that we have on these young men and young women. Make sure that they don't let any foreign influences get into their world or certainly that they don't do anything that could harm them 
and it's in their minds. This is this is what the schools are saying or the school administrations are saying. It's something, it's it's a Kool-Aid, if you will, that the parents are drinking as well. And it leads to um, a very narrow path. Sometimes one of the terms that is used for a child who's gone off the path of observance is off the derech, off the path. It leads to a very narrow path. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to slip off the derech, off the path, if you can't experiment at all. Maybe there's one or two days a year you can experiment on Purim, on the holiday where we dress up as kind of like a Jewish combination of Halloween and St. Patrick's Day. I know that doesn't do it justice, but um, on Purim, you know, we dress up in, in, in costumes, but instead of asking for tricks and treats, we bring food to other people. But, but you know, that. so, so um, that's a day where we can dress up and look a little different than we usually do, but otherwise no experimentation. So, so the thought that we in our community, in the strictly Orthodox community at least, do not value experimentation and don't leave room for identity formation really runs at odds with general principles of development of child and adolescent development. And it's something that I've been trying to work with um, people in the community to try to just help them understand there's another way to look at this. Going back to that earlier question, it means sitting down with a parent and saying, your child is saying that just like you were a rebel, I too am a rebel, is not so crazy. Mm -hmm. not ridiculous. There's a logic, there's method to the madness. I see. And so that got me thinking because you had, you had when you talked about um, the, uh, you know, even children who are raised by parents who were themselves raised in, in a similarly observant religious um, environment. Um, and, and you'd said if there's, if there's ever a time, if there was ever a generation or a time when when kids are growing up in a different world than their parents, and I'm paraphrasing, so if I'm, if there's anything that needs clarification, please do. This is it, um, and, and I, certainly there's a, a tremendous amount of truth to that statement. Um, at the same time, you know, when we think about the, for example, the waves, the wave of immigration after World War II, and the literal world that those people were coming from and the world to which they were coming um, could arguably, you know, the argument could be made that the, the difference there um, is as stark. Not, maybe not technologically like we have it today, but in terms of just, um, you know, community and, and, and world view and, and, and the, 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 the distance, you know, it, it, the psychological distance from the old world to the new world and all of that. Um, and, and, and so, uh, you know, I don't know if this is an argument that's made, but, uh, well, certainly there were many people who did leave observance when they came to the New World, and, and certainly uh, the children of those who did. Um, but for someone to say, hey, listen, you know, my, my parents were uh, from another world and another generation, and, and um, uh, the, that the greatest argument of all time, and I came out okay, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, so, so what's wrong with my kid? Or maybe what's wrong with me? And maybe that's part of the question is, where do you see parents placing the blame? Do they tend to find guilt in themselves for not having done a good enough job? Or do they tend to, uh, you know, present it as my child is broken? Both. Both. It's, it's rarely one or the other. Uh, you're, it's it's hard to separate it out. It's hard, and it goes back again to the mythology that if I am, if I do all the right things Jewishly, if I model a consistent observant, a consistently observant home, a home where we try to bring joy into our world, and uh, we we follow what the teachers say, and and we are respectful of the teachers and respectful of the rabbis in our community, then we can fashion a, our children as such, as, as being observant as well, and being from as well. And um, so if it doesn't work, then we've, we must have done something wrong, I guess. And it, it's people, when, when something goes wrong, people will find, if you look, if you look long and hard enough, you could find 
something that you've done wrong. It's almost like a trauma mo moment when, when something traumatic happens and you work with trauma victims, I work with trauma victims, they'll often blame themselves. I work with trauma victims, one, one in particular it comes to mind who was raped by her boyfriend and she's haunted by the fact that she probably noticed or that she's haunted by the um, imagination that she has that she probably should have seen in his eyes that that date was going to be different. That that date was going to be different and that she was going to, um, and that she was something bad was going to happen and she should have gotten out of his car at this point or at that point or should have bolted from his house mm -hmm. at a point, even though he used physical brute force to hold her down and to rape her. Uh, and the basic phenomenon that we're talking about is that powerlessness, the powerlessness of trauma is so terrible that we'd rather be guilty than powerless. Because if we're guilty, at least we have some sort of control over it. And in a similar way, I'm going to use a strong term, maybe it doesn't fit into large T trauma, classic trauma, where there's a near-death experience, but it's almost a spiritual death experience. When a child comes home and he's not wearing, when a boy comes home and he's not wearing a yarmulke, or a daughter comes home and she's dressed in a very different way than you ever saw her before, the trauma is such that instead of saying I'm powerless over this, I'd rather say that I'm somehow to blame. Uh -huh. And that certainly explains um, a lot of the, the, the distress that, that uh, the parents clearly feel. And I think, you know, you will probably um, agree that, this, that it, it's, it's a common experience as a psychotherapist that um, the, the initial complaint or the presenting uh, problem as it were that clients come in with through the door is very often um, just a, a very superficial front to what's to what the, the problem is and that uh, it, it tends to uh, to exist on a much deeper level and and so the the complaint well my child is is not uh, following the the uh, you know the way that he or she was raised um, well, may, maybe fairly easily once that's peeled away, the well, I'm to I'm to blame, or what have I done to cause this thing kind of comes up. And it's so meaningful that 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 Orthodox people raise their children as being observant. That mm -hmm. truly devastating. Mm -hmm. It is really devastating. So the very fact, and maybe this is something that you and I haven't talked about, the very fact of the child's non-observance. And the possibility that is present, that the non-observance is something that will continue indefinitely, is so devastating and, and just so horrible to a parent. In and of itself, even before we start attributing blame, is it my fault as a parent? Is it the child's fault as a child? Mm -hmm. Just a tragedy. It's a tragedy that is experienced by, by parents and, and so, so painful. So as we sort of uh, wind down on the time that we've um, allocated for our conversation today, um, perhaps you can shed some light or talk for just a few moments about your thoughts about what, what families and what communities might be able to do to, to develop a greater level of acceptance, um, to um, maybe be, be better supports, to be more supportive, of youth, you know, and typically it is adolescents and or young adults uh, who choose their own path. And how can they do that without sending this message that we condone what you're doing? Because as you said, it's a, it's a very meaningful lifestyle. Um, it's a very, uh, it, it, it's one that um, parents- It means orthodoxy. With, yes, yes. Yeah. Well, and, and I would say, you know, again, I, I think that's probably a true statement for the lifestyles that many observantly religious people have. They yeah. find it very meaningful and their, uh, their, their intent in raising their children that way is not to brainwash their children, but to gift their children what they've been raised with and, and, or what they found on their own, you know, as it were. And, and so, it, so yes, of course, it's hurtful and it's painful to see someone, um, you know, give that up or find that meaningless or insignificant. But it sounds like there's also a, a very 
uh, significant importance in not alienating uh, people and uh, family members and, and loved ones um, over something like this. And so what are your thoughts about how that balance can be struck? Most of the children who are no longer observant know that it's painful to their parents. And if to the extent that their parents continue in their own observance, I think the children recognize that this is not a lifestyle that my, uh, the unobservant lifestyle is not one that my parents have chosen. They've chosen to be observant and I'm choosing to be different. So it's not, rarely do I see the, the, the danger, so to speak, of a child thinking that his parents um, condone such behavior or that they, you know, they think it's perfectly okay. What I do think is really, really, really important is for parents to remember that they remain the parents of that child. There's so many things that still can continue in your relationship, whether or not your child makes blessings before he eats, whether or not your daughter covers her elbows and her knees or other parts of her body, whether your children are keeping Shabbos, Shabbat or not, you still um, can, you're still there to feed them. You're there to clothe them. You might not support all of their clothing choices and that's, you know, but you, you're there to help them. You're, uh, you're there to show concern for them. And whenever possible, show concern about their world. If there's any part of their world that you can still find congruence with or some sort of intersection with, why not, why not find a way to participate in it? Your child likes to ride bikes. He, he's, he's a big biker. Why can't you be part of that? He runs marathons. He or she is musical. If there's any way, if there's any area of intersection, be open to that and be sensitive about the areas where you disagree. Be able to have conversations without, without ad hominem, without attacking the person of the child. It's, you're still there to protect and to nurture your child, even as that child is not observant. And here's where it gets really interesting. Some children might find their way back because you've kept up the relationship and you've shown that the relationship stands no matter what. And they've, you know, they've now, they've proven to themselves that you care about them just because they are your child, period. Some, some children might not come back. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's how it works. You're still their parent. You're still their parent. You can still love them. You can still care for them, even as you don't agree with their choices. So it sounds like it's a lot about a, 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 a adopting a, a mindset, a mindset of, of, as you said, congruence and common, common ground and commonality. And, it, it, you know, maybe this is a, a nice place to kind of close for now. Um, it, it reminds me of, a, of, of two interpretations of, of uh, a passage that you and I might both be uh, familiar with, and that is, that, uh, and, and you, you might have the source handy and I don't, but that is uh, that uh, there's, there's a passage that goes something to the effect that even the sinners among us are filled with good deeds and good qualities as a pomegranate is full of seeds. And there, and there is a, um, an interesting sort of uh, contrast in perspectives where one great thinker asked, how, how, how could it be that someone who's a sinner is full of good deeds. How does that, how does that work? But there is a, there, there, and, and, and so what's the meaning of a passage that says that a sinner is full of good deeds? In other words, trying to make sense out of what possible good deeds could this person have? But there's a opposite side of that coin. And that is a perspective that says, how is it possible that someone who is filled with good deeds could be referred to as a sinner. And so in a similar way, for a parent to adopt the mindset of how is it possible for me to look at this child who is beautiful and capable and, and capable and talented in so many different ways, um, for me to identify them by this one area of 
difference that they may have with how I raised them. And so I don't know if you have any uh, reflections on that thought, but... Uh, I'll share just one, but it is, it's quite moving what you've shared, David. And, and um, it relates to something that m many Jewish people say, which is that derech eretz kadma Torah, it means that the ability to live a balanced life, to be a mensch, uh, many people would say, um, is something, it's a skill, it's a property, it's a trait that one has to have even before one is observing. Um, to, we didn't really get into all the different variations of children who are no longer observant, but many of the children who are no longer observant still observe Derech Eretz. I don't just mean that they're respectful to their parents and they're, they bow in deference to them. I mean, I mean they're able to live their lives in a productive, meaningful way. It might not be the meaningful way that you had in mind with the particular religious trajectory that you had in mind, but all the same, they're living their lives in a meaningful way. Recognize that. Recognize, guys, might have, you might have hit the Derek Harris even as you haven't hit the Torah. And I will prize that. And I will value that. And I will look at you as that beautiful pomegranate, as you said, that is, and, and say, how can I view you as a sinner when there's some, so much beauty to you? Well, on that note, I'd like to thank you so much for, for joining me today and, and, and for enlightening myself and our viewers with with your insight and your wisdom into this uh, particular topic um is is there anywhere uh anywhere on, on the web where it, people can find you or can um you know read what you've written or maybe watch other talks that you've given and so forth is there something you'd like to plug let's see uh there are um i am on linkedin with my name yehuda crone uh, I do post stuff there. Um, I'm even on Twitter, Yehuda Crone again. Um, but I do have a, um, a blog site on nefesh.org where I do post a good number of articles that talk about parenting, not just how to guarantee the right outcome, but parenting with mindfulness, the developmental needs of a child. And so on that blog site, if you go to nefesh.org and you hit blogs and then you look for my name or my, the, the name of my blog is called Best Practice. If you find that, then you'll be able to find more of my writings. I can't think of any other sites that have anything more significant other than one or two you know, pieces scattered here or there. Well, um, I will definitely link to that blog uh, in the uh, video description on YouTube. And for those that are watching this elsewhere, N-E-F-E-S-H dot org. And uh, you can find the blog um, section from the menu there on the main page. And you can follow from there to Dr. Crone's uh, writings. Once again, thank you for, for joining me. Uh, I, I appreciate the time that you've taken. And... Uh, I hope we'll have an opportunity to talk about this or other topics in the future. I would love that. Thank you so much for inviting me and for hosting me, David. Okay. Have a great day.